Hmm. Okay, they're sending our kids to college to get degrees that are not even economically or financially relevant in the real world. And you don't see black children going to trade schools the way you see Chinese children or uh, uh, Mexican children and uh, white children. They still go to the trades. And, you know, I'm in the process of renovating the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy. I'm actually talking to you as I sit out here at the school campus waiting for one of my contractors to come Hmm. through. And I mean, this is we're paying big money. I mean, plumbing. Estimates, a hundred thousand dollars. HVAC estimates, over a quarter of a million dollars. And you're talking three weeks worth of work. So mm-hmm. when you look at the money that plumbers and electricians and HVACers and roofers are making, they're making in three weeks what surgeons are making in an entire year. Mm-hmm. So we have to turn our kids back onto the building trades because without the skills that pay the bills, you're likely to end up behind bars. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's real. Mm-hmm. That's real. And, you know, I've been hearing about your school. I've seen the controversy. I hate you have to deal with that, you know, but I guess with everything big you're trying to do, that's going to happen. You know, I want to let you know, uh, keep pushing. I'm glad you're there to do it. You know, I, I saw at one point you were having a problem with the HVAC and uh, getting the what you needed to get that happen. Has that happened yet? Uh, it looks like, and again, we have two schools, so we're focusing on the Garvey building right now. We haven't even began to address the Frederick Douglass High School, which is about three times as big. Okay. And I'm actually, and I, I'm absolutely in love with that school because once that gets renovated, it will be the largest black independent school campus in the United States. Hmm. Uh, no other independent black school has two schools and two gyms. Um, and let me also say, uh, right before I answer your question, that on September the 11th, we will be having a block party okay. here at the campus. Although the schools are not renovated and we can't go inside of them yet until we do, we're not going to wait any longer. We want to bring people to the campus so they can at least see the buildings from the outside, feel the energy. So on Saturday, September the 11th, which is Ethiopian New Year, hmm. uh, 911 Ethiopian New Year, we're going to have vendors. We're going to have food. We're going to have games, uh, water rides for the children. Uh, there's going to be popcorn, pictures, music. It's just going to be a good day to honor all the people who helped us get this far. So I've received a lot of donation checks from the state of Texas, uh, not just Houston, but Dallas, San Antonio, Austin, Longview, all around Texas. They've really uh, showed up and helped Dr. Umar over these past seven years. So I'm hoping that a lot of our Texas supporters make that drive, make that flight, you know, make that train ride or that bus ride up to Wilmington, Delaware on Saturday, September the 11th from 11 until uh, 8 p.m. We're going to be out here. It's a chance to talk to me, to meet me, ask me any questions, mm-hmm. and just for our donors to see what exactly it was that they have been donating to. And our campus is 22 driving minutes from the Philadelphia International Airport. Wilmington, Delaware is Philadelphia's backyard. So even though it's a different state, it's right in back of us. And so if you're flying in, you want to fly into the Philadelphia International Airport, it'll take you uh, 20 minutes uh, to get to the campus from there. Um, so that's that that we're really looking forward to that. And we're getting ready for that right now. As far as the HVAC situation, we solved it from the perspective that I finally found an HVAC who is not going to rip me off mm-hmm. and who's going to do the job, you know, in, 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 in an efficient way and in a cost effective way. The problem is the unit, the roof unit for the elementary school is not really a problem. I guess I say the obstacle is that it's a custom made unit which means it's going to take 90 days to prepare, to uh, to create another one. Hmm. So what okay. that means is my timeline for having elementary school totally renovated and ready by the end of the summer just got obliterated. Hmm. <laughs> That's the, yeah. you know, so yeah. this whole FDMG experience, my brother, and I will be writing a book on it. I will be writing a book building FDMG because I have so many stories, some good, some bad about what we've been through to get here, my brother. We've been taken advantage of. We've been ripped off by black, all black contractors. Yeah. Some of them have gotten money, didn't finish their work. Some of them have let let their workers uh, steal stuff out of school. Mm-hmm. We have been through a lot, a whole lot. Yeah. So I am happy that we finally found out, uh, you know, what we got to do to get the HVAC system running. It, it is going to obliterate our timeline because the unit will not be delivered before september 9th okay you know so that's a shame but yeah. i'm still hoping we can get it up in, in place before it gets too cold outside yeah mm-hmm. it'll happen and uh you know i worked on a project with someone and it's something i realized like every contractor if not now i won't say every but most of them at some time have messed somebody over they've brought somebody over one time or another it yeah. is such a hard thing to keep your eye and to watch a contractor especially if 
you're you i'm sure you've learned so much about building in this time that oh, you can go man i have man i've gotten an education brother and yeah still learn. <laughs> yeah and still learn and it's someone you can go talk to that's building projects that will laugh at the amount of money that you've got gotten for because they've got gotten for way more mm. wow yeah because there's people beat people that's what they do mm -hmm. why i don't know it's the, it's the setup yeah. but i'm glad you're in the realm now where you can you know Get things going and get this AC happening because I, you know, I pay attention, I watch, and I see haters that are trying to poke a hole in everything they can possibly find oh, to do with your school. Everything, hmm. everything, but brother, they have contacted the governor of uh, both Pennsylvania, my, my the state where I hold residence, and also Delaware, the state where the school is. They've contacted the attorney general, license and inspection. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. We had a cleanup day here. Uh, the summer we bought the school and all it was was volunteers who came out and we wanted to move all the furniture out of the Garvey Elementary School into the Douglas High School. So all we did was take furniture out and move it across the street. Would you believe that these Negroes called L and I and said I was in there renovating the building without any licenses or permits? And so L and I showed up and they were going to shut down our cleanup day until I had to force them to walk through the school and see if you see anybody doing any repairs. Mm -hmm. We're moving desks. We're moving chairs. We're moving books. Mm -hmm. We're moving computers out the way. So when I do finally get the contractors I need in here, they won't have to climb over anything to do their job. Right. You know, but that's the type of stuff I've been going through, my brother. We've had break-ins. Somebody broke into the high school, set it on fire, and tried to burn it down. Mm. My brother, I'm telling wow. you, mm. there's so much to write about this experience that I can't even make it a chapter in my own political autobiography. It has to have its own book. And uh, we, we're still not there, but I do, I, I do feel a lot better now than I did two and a half years ago when we purchased the school on February the 7th of 2019. So there is some progress. It is extremely slow, but it's coming. And the interesting thing about the haters, you know, as you mentioned, you have never built anything for black people. You've never built a commercial institution of any level. Mm -hmm. So how can you dare criticize something you've never done, never tried, and have no experience in? I mean, when you look at the backgrounds of the people offering criticisms, it makes you laugh. I mean, let's just be honest. Black people are not known for institution building. We have very few institutions that we own outside of our own personal businesses. Mm -hmm. But institutions that are supposed to serve the community, we don't build those. I mean, this school is probably one of the, I know it's one of the only independent black schools that absolutely took no funding from another race. We do have independent black schools wow. out there who get funded by white folks through grants and other things like that. Mm -hmm. But of course, with me being a Pan-Africanist and a follower of the teachings of the Honorable Marcus Garvey, we believe in self-sufficiency, self-determination, and self-reliance. So this school was purchased by Black Pennies, and this school will be renovated by Black Pennies, and will probably be the only school that can absolutely say that, that the only money that operates this school is money from black people. Hmm. That's something to say. I, I wanted to um, ask you just about that in, in, in the vein of that kind of personally, like with all of that, that comes with just being who you are and, and, and you know, what you're building. How do you personally like remain motivated and positive through those things? Um, I, 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 I'm spiritually based. So I stay prayed up. I do a lot of meditation you know, I've had some initiations into traditional African spirituality just to make sure I'm in alignment with my ancestors and with the various divine spirits that the creator sent into this world to help us fulfill our destiny. So, you know, without that anchor, I don't know where I would be. And, um, you know, I thank God that I went to Africa in 2005 for the first time. Of course, I've been there many times since. But, you know, when I went into that Gory Island slave dungeon off the coast of Senegal, I had an epiphany that night. You know, I had an experience that I still can't fully explain while I was wide awake, mind you. Mm -hmm. And that's what led me to look into traditional African spirituality. And I found out that it was actually my ancestors that were welcoming me, welcoming me back home. And I was told I was meant to be a priest. And so, you mm -hmm. know, I've stuck pretty closely to the traditional African spirituality side of our culture. And without it, I don't think I would I would I would have survived. I probably would have had a stroke or a heart attack by now with the types of uh, betrayals and sabotages and setbacks that my own people have put in my path. But with that being said, though, I got to be absolutely clear and honest mm -hmm. that most of our people love Dr. Umar and support me. If they didn't, we wouldn't have the school. Mm -hmm. You know, if they didn't, we wouldn't be where we are right now with the renovation. So you do have a little 
crowd of haters and detractors who are very active and loud. But at right. the end of the day, it's mostly all love. And so I try to focus on the three quarters of the glass that is filled versus the one quarter that is empty. Mm, that's heavy. So I got a question for you. So when you were young, man, Dr. Umar, 16 and earlier, what did you want to do? Did you know what you wanted to do? What were you thinking about? When I was in the third grade, we were living in uh, North Carolina uh, for a couple of years there. My parents were married and it was in the third grade that I knew I wanted to be a psychologist. Hmm. Um, so that was about eight years old. I already knew it. I wanted to help people feel better about themselves. And then when my parents divorced and I came back to Philadelphia, the elementary school that I attended had a mandatory black history class in the fourth and fifth grade. And it was Mrs. Green, who I coincidentally ran into for the first time in like over 30 years, a few years ago. But she is the one who sparked my love for black consciousness. Mm. And it must have been something divine in all of that, because I'm the only student from that black history class who fell in love with consciousness. Hmm. Nobody else did. And um, and then in sixth grade, between the sixth and eighth grade, I'm going to say six. My father took me to my first family reunion, and that's when I learned that I was related to Frederick Douglass. Hmm. We were in Baltimore, Maryland. We were walking in the back of his church, and I saw all this Frederick Douglass memorabilia, his clothes, his Bible, his pipe. And I said, what is all this Frederick Douglass stuff here? And, of course, I learned who he was through the Black History class, and my father said, you're related to him. And I said, wow. And, you know, ever since then, you know, I kind of felt that I was obligated to try to help finish the work you know, that he had started, you know, and not just Frederick Douglass, but I'm related to him by way of my four times great grandfather, uh, Stephen Henry Bailey, uh, who was his first cousin. That's the Stephen that Frederick mentions in his uh, narratives of having spent most of his childhood with. And mm -hmm. my grandfather, Stephen, was present in uh, Texas on June 19th, 1865, when General Granger read Special Order Number 3, which later became the Juneteenth celebration. My grandfather was there. Wow. He was also at Appomattox uh, when Robert E. Lee surrendered. And his son was there, my three times great-grandfather, George Washington Bailey, the uh, cousin of Frederick Douglass, but also the first black public school teacher of uh, Denton, Maryland. So, you know, there's just a lot there for me to try to, uh, there's a legacy there for me to try to uphold. And so when I do all the work that I do, I really do it always asking myself, what do the ancestors think of me? You know, am mm -hmm. I doing as much as I can? Am I doing it the best way that I can? You mm -hmm, know, because mm -hmm. one thing I want to be able to do is when it's time for me to go back to the ancestors, when it's time for me to get in that box and be put in the ground, I want to be at peace with how I spent my life. I want to be at peace with how I dedicated my life. Because a lot of black people, I see too many of them chasing money, chasing status, chasing fame, chasing materialism. You know, I thank God for my parents that they never raised me to worship things they never raised me to be bougie they never raised me to think that i was better than other people so even now with all my degrees and accolades and awards and so forth and so on i'm just another one of the people you know mm -hmm. i travel alone i walk into the stores alone you know I, I and i believe i get the love that i get because i am so down to earth you know so i'm just thankful for it. it's a hard road it is not an easy road and the harder it becomes the more i you know, honor the sacrifice of Dr. King, the sacrifice of Malcolm, the sacrifice of Garvey, of Ida B. Wells, of Fannie Lou Hamer, you know, Harriet, the soldiers of the Civil War, Huey P., Fred Hampton. Mm -hmm. You know, the more I go through this, the more I say, wow, those must have been some strong men and women because this is not easy. Mm. Yeah, that's heavy, man. That's, that's pretty heavy. So let me ask you this. So how did your when you uh, did your parents have a, like a, a certain thing that they felt you, sh you should do? Well, my my mother was Christian. My father was a Sunni Orthodox Muslim. So I was raised with a strong religious foundation. They themselves didn't introduce me into the consciousness. Mm -hmm. Ironically enough, most people think that, you know, I come from a family where he must have been born and bred in black consciousness. That's not true. I come from ancestors who were born and bred in the struggle. Right. You know, Frederick Douglass and my grandfathers and also uh, Bishop Alexander Wayman, who was the seventh bishop of the AME Church uh, after Richard Island. He was also one of the original managers of the Philadelphia Underground Railroad. Uh, I'm related mm. to him as well because my three times great grandfather, George, the cousin of Frederick Douglass, married the niece, my grandmother, Annie Wayman. That's the niece of Bishop Wayman. So I'm also related to one of the probably more transcendental AME pastors. Uh, but that's where I get a lot of, you know, my honor and obligation from is from that because 
I don't believe it's a coincidence that I was born into that family. I don't think it's a coincidence I became psychologist. I don't think it's a coincidence I was born on that Turner Day, August 21st, so forth and so on, which I'll be spending in Kenosha, uh, Wisconsin this year at the request of uh, Jacob Blake's family. His father reached mm-hmm. out to me and uh, asked me to come and speak at the Raleigh. As you know, he was shot and paralyzed by the police in Kenosha, August the 23rd of 2020. So on Saturday, August the 21st, they're going to honor him with the March and Raleigh, and I was asked to participate. So this will be the first time in 11 years that I will not be at the Nat Turner Trail in Virginia, which is where I normally spend my birthday honoring Nat Turner and the Nat Turner Army because it was August 21st, 1831, when they led the most successful slave revolt in American history. Hmm. Wow. So I'm looking at um, this. Is your you've been touring to talk about this book, and it, I see a hashtag on here. And uh, forgive me if this is not exactly related, but it says "State of the Race." And so overall, the messaging that you have with your book, with the, your appearances, and your the things that you've been talking about, you know, what is the what are you seeing right now? What is the, what do you see as the state, and where are you, uh, where are you going? Where are we going? The race, we are going into an extinction if we do not realize our own responsibilities to ourselves. Black people are the most politically lazy group in America. And when I say politically lazy, allow me to clarify. I don't mean we're lazy when it comes to going to work. Mm -hmm. I don't mean we're lazy when it comes to opening our own businesses and restaurants and hair salons. I don't mean it that way. I mean collectively. As a community, we don't do anything economically and politically to transform our reality. I mean, black people are a $2 trillion industry. We're the richest group of Africans in the world. Mm -hmm. We spend $30 billion on beauty products a year, $2 billion on Air Jordans, $4 billion on liquor, $800 million on chicken, turkey, beef, and pork. But yet we don't have a single community in this entire country. Not one where you can find a black owned bank, black owned school, black owned supermarket and black owned hospital. Those are the four essential institutions of a community. You need the hospital to save the life. You need the school to train the life. You need the bank to invest in the life and you need the supermarket to feed the life. But I can go to places where there's independent Mexican communities Uh, right here in Philadelphia. I can take you to the Puerto Rican community. Mm -hmm. Uh, Well, I'm in Delaware, but. In Philadelphia, I can take you to the Puerto Rican community where they have their own savings and loan institution. They have their own supermarket. They have their own clinics. You understand? They have their own banks. I can show you that in Chinatown. I can show it with the Vietnamese and the Arabs and the East Indians, but I can't show it with the black folks. And that's because we are so self-hating, so self-hating that we would rather be exterminated than work together in order to protect ourselves. Here's the point. America isn't going to do anything else for black people. They're done. Part of it is our fault because we celebrated Barack Obama like he was some sort of a gift. Wow. He did absolutely nothing for black people. And in Not those eight years that we celebrated Obama, America took black people back to an era that I would say is worse than the 1960s. What we're going through right now mm-hmm. is arguably worse than the 1960s. Like none of your rights are being respected. The police are killing us off. The government won't even say anything about it. And mm-hmm. at the same time, all of the civil rights that Dr. King and others died for are being used to protect the gays and used to protect the Asians and used to protect the immigrants. They're not even being used to protect the people who died for them, which is black people. But once again, a lot of this is our fault. We allowed it to get this this bad. And Mm -hmm. it's going to get a lot worse if we don't do something about it. It will get worse. So the question is, how long are we going to sit around and act like we're not responsible for the stuff that's happening to us? Yes, the government created the problems, but it's our job to solve them. And I don't really see black people solving the problems. Mm -hmm. Uh, We keep talking about our history and how great we were and all this and that. And I don't have a problem with that. But when are we going to start talking about the future? Most of our conversation is about the past. Mm -hmm. When are we going to start having conversations about the African future? What does the future look like for black people in America? That's what we're supposed to be dealing with. And that's one of the reasons why I built this school, because I believe that in order for us to change who we are, or go back to who we're supposed to be, we got to teach the children. The children got to understand the world they're living in and their responsibilities towards changing it. And I don't really see any schools doing that. One of the most disheartening things I've found traveling around the world, and of course I've spoken on every continent except Australia, and that is every black school I've ever been to, every black child is being taught either by non-Africans or by non-African curriculum. Mm -hmm. Even in Africa, they're either being taught by non-Africans 
or non-African curriculum. And that's absolutely sad that you can't really go anywhere in the world and find black children being trained up the way that they're supposed to be. And if the children aren't psychologically liberated, there's no way that our future is going to be liberated either. Hmm. Mm -hmm. That's heavy. Black children are not raised to be loyal to the black community. Mm -hmm. We're the only people who do not value community loyalty. Every other child, they are loyal. Chinese children are loyal to Chinese people. Jewish kids are loyal to the Jewish community. And one of the biggest reasons why our children are not loyal to us is because we don't do anything for them. I mean, what do black what does black America do systemically to benefit black children? Mm -hmm. Not very much. Most scholarships that our children get come from white folks. I mean, yeah, you got your fraternities with some scholarships and you got a couple of black philanthropists with some scholarships. Mm -hmm. But systemically, systemically, there is no process in black America to protect, advocate for or provide opportunities for black children. And as long as they have to go to white folks in order to get their opportunities, they'll never be loyal to us. Loyalty is a two way street. You can't expect your citizens to be loyal to its community. If the community isn't loyal to its citizens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're tearing up. I don't want to say we're tearing up community, but we are. But I looked and I know there's yeah. a saying I'm saying it uh, not exactly the way it was quoted. But one of the Rothschilds said when there's blood on the ground buy land and we are we're that's where we're at. You know, everything is crazy. The land is bought up. We're gone. Mm. Mm. That's it. absolutely. And it's getting so bad globally for African people that even in Africa, where a lot of countries don't allow non-Africans to own land, non-citizens to own land. But they do do these 99 year leases that they yeah. renew, wow. you know, every century. And I'm seeing now we're in places like South Africa where you are born there. You know, you're considered a citizen. And so you have a lot of non-Africans buying up the land in places where non-Africans, if they're born there, you know, are given citizenship status. That in some countries in Africa, if the takeover of the land continues at the rate in which it is being done, uh, we may even be gentrified out of entire countries in Africa. Hmm. So you're you're possibly down the road looking at what will the future look like for African people globally if we don't own any land right. because right now the world is operating on an agenda to rid all black people of their right to any land anywhere on the planet earth let mm. that sink in yeah. Yeah, that's heavy yeah. so what do you think you know haiti's president just got assassinated yesterday mm. yeah he did so what does and this a mean of, uh, <laughs> Well, a couple of weeks ago, the president of uh, Tanzania, Brother John Michael Fuli, he was also assassinated. I didn't know that. And according to his cabinet, that was carried out either by the Americans, uh, the British, or by um, the Chinese, because the Chinese wanted him to sell the port of Tanzania. He wouldn't do it. Unfortunately, Jamaica did sell their port to the Chinese, which is just absolutely ridiculous. You know, because when you control a port, you control what comes in and what goes out. Right. Mm -hmm. And if the Chinese control the port of Jamaica, you don't know what they're bringing into Jamaica. Drugs, guns, you don't know what they're doing. Right. You know, bad food. You know, you just never sell your port. You know, but, you know, thirsty black leadership, you know, in America and Africa and Caribbean. It's a problem that we have. Now, getting back to the president of Haiti, and as you know, Haiti has been in turmoil for a long time. Because of outside influence, America, you know, France, they never wanted Haiti to become the progressive, productive nation that it could have been as a result of how they embarrassed the global white power structure by defeating Napoleon's army back in 1801. They've never forgiven Haiti for that, even though Haiti's responsible for the current size of America, because that war with the Haitian uh, slave army is what bankrupted France and forced them to sell to America, its stake of land in this country, which became the Louisiana Purchase, which basically quadrupled the size of this country. Hmm. So America actually owes the debt to Haiti for America being as large as she is, you see. But America has repaid Haiti for that by constantly sabotaging their economy, having its leaders assassinated. Now, with this particular leader, I don't know if this was a state sponsored assassination or whether he was taken out by some goons. Because he was not considered a man of the people. Mm -hmm. uh, he was not considered a man of the people. A lot of people thought he was a stooge for the U.S. government. And because he was considered a flunky uh, for the U.S. government, I think he may have been taken out by Haitians who got tired of him being in there. Or maybe uh, some of the gangsters that he was rolling with and had agreements with. And maybe he didn't do something right and they decided to take him out. But yet and still, it's never right to see an African get murdered. It's never right to see anybody get murdered. And, of course, his wife was shot up as well. But yeah. I believe she survived. I yeah, think she, she survived. I believe she survived. You know, yeah. it's always sad to see our women 
get caught up in that. But, you know, when you deal with leadership, man, you know, we, we, we romanticize the liberation struggle. But if you were to talk to any ancestor who lived through it, I don't think they would romanticize it the way we do. You know, Dr. King would not romanticize the fact that his house got sh- uh, sh- bombed <laughs> twice with his wife and children inside. You know, right. Malcolm mm-hmm. wouldn't romanticize the fact that he had to spend the last year of his life on a run from jealous idiots, you know, that he was formerly associated with, you know, and, and, and to get shot and killed in front of his wife and children. You know, Mega ever shot in his own driveway. You know, Nelson Mandela, 27 years in jail. Winnie Mandela dealing with constant harassment from the government. You know, it's not a glory road. You do it because you have to, not because you want to. And again, that's why those of us who have this calling on our life to be sincere with the people, because there's a lot of folks out there who just hustle black leadership as a con game. But for those of us who are sincere with it, you got to stay grounded. you got to stay connected to mm-hmm. God. Mm -hmm. because this work can destroy you. You know, people often ask the question, why did so many members of the original Black Panther Party turn to drugs, you know, later in life? And it's because, you know, that work, you know, they saw their comrades killed and murdered on a daily basis. Right. Their childhood friends murdered by the police. I mean, the Black Panthers may have suffered more casualties than any other black liberation movement I know of, except the UNIA ACL, the Honorable Marcus Garvey, the Panthers. I mean, they took out hundreds of the Panthers across the country. So when you're dealing with those pressures, being arrested, having your house bombed, your friends shot and killed, police raids all through the night, you know, yes, it might lead you to smoke alcohol, smoke some weed or alcohol or, as Huey P. Newton, they said, you know, ended up on crack cocaine. Yeah. You know, I'm not judging him for that because I look at the sacrifice that he made to try to keep our community safe from police genocide. So it's a hell of a price that you pay. And that's why you got to be spiritually grounded, because if you're not, you will end up addicted to something. Right. 